Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to module 3.5. And in the I guess the last week and the first four modules of this week, we have seen these basic NEGF equations of quantum transport and how you apply them to 1D and then lately to the 2D problems. And we have talked about how you write H. That was largely week one. And then we talked about how to write the sigmas. For 1D, it was relatively straightforward. For 2Ds, it's a little more subtle, but that we have talked about in the last two modules. Now, in this module, what I'd like to tell you about is how you can include magnetic fields into this description. And what I'll tell you is how the magnetic field is included in the Hamiltonian H. Of course, once you have it in the H, you could use the method from the last module to calculate your sigmas anyway. So what I need to tell you is how to put it in the H, because that's something in general we talked about in week one, but we never, I didn't bring up magnetic fields at this time, at that time. So why are we talking about magnetic fields? Well. One reason is, one important reason is, that I want to tell you a little bit about this quantum Hall effect, which actually is a very important thing in this field of mesoscopic physics. Of course, like all Hall effect, it involves measuring the transverse voltage across a sample when a current is flowing. So if you have a current flowing in one direction and there's a magnetic field, you can actually pick up a voltage in the transverse direction. And that's usually, and if you look at the ratio of that voltage to this current, people call that the Hall resistance. And usually that Hall resistance goes linearly with magnetic field, keeps increasing. And for low fields, that's a very common measurement people make. Now what was striking about this quantum Hall effect is that at high magnetic fields, people found that that Hall resistance could be written as this quantum of resistance and then an integer, m. So this h over q square and then divided by an integer. Now, this is something we have seen a lot in this course because as you know, the ballistic resist, the ballistic conductors have resistances that look like that. But there's an important difference and that's this. In ballistic conductors, when we say the resistance is approximately that, it's really approximately that. It is like within plus or minus a few percent. Why? Well, because we are talking about solids. There's all kinds of things in there that are not in our models. So what we expect from our idealized models, that doesn't match experiments exactly. As long as it is within a few percent, we say, well, at least we got all the important things covered. Thing about the quantum Hall resistance is that it's actually precisely this. What people found was that's actually the what they measure out to a few places in decimal. So to the point that this is actually being used as a standard for resistance, resistance standards. Now the question is how did that happen? And that's the kind of thing I'd like to tell you a little bit about. And of course the basic effect is already covered in our models. What I mean by that is whatever we have discussed so far, if we just can adjust the Hamiltonian to include the magnetic field, it would come out of the model. Of course, it doesn't mean you'll have understood it because I've often stressed that calculating something and understanding something are two different things. But the first step is to know how to calculate it correctly. And then, of course, once you have the results, that's when the hard work of understanding can start, see? Anyway, so what I'd like to describe to you is how you could use what we have described, what we have discussed, to calculate this Hall effect and specifically how to write the H. Because if you have a conductor like this, we need an H here. And once you have the H, you can then figure out the sigmas using the method from the last module. So how would you write the H? Well, before we had any magnetic fields, the way we did it was, if you remember, that if you had a two-dimensional conductor, there's a diagonal element epsilon, and it's coupled to the nearest neighbors by this T. And so the EK relation looks like epsilon 
plus t e to the power i k x a and t e to the power minus i k x a. You see, the, this term comes from the coupling to the right, plus x. This comes from the coupling to the left, minus x. And then there's a similar term coupling to the, in the plus y and another one coming from minus y. Now for this discussion, you know, this what I'll be describing to you is how a magnetic field would modify those couplings. And for this discussion, actually, we don't really need the y part of it. So let's just figure out how to handle the x part of the story, this part. You see, and then you'll see the rest will kind, you can see almost by analogy what to expect. But that way it keeps the algebra simple. So let me take out the y part of the story. We don't worry about this part. Now if you recall what we had done before, in order to connect it to the usual energy relation which is quadratic. The way you usually do that is, this one you can combine the e to the power plus i k x a and the e to the power minus i k x a. You can combine those two things to write epsilon plus 2t cosine k x a. I've just combined the two exponentials and then we use this simple expansion for cosines, if you remember, that cosine x is equal to or approximately equal to 1 minus half x squared. So if you use that, then what you get is, this is equal to epsilon plus 2t times 1 minus kx squared a squared over 2. Okay, And usually then the next step is write it as epsilon plus 2t minus t a squared times kx squared. And this you usually make it correspond to the result that you expect, which is that this constant should be EC and this part should be h bar squared over 2m, where m is the effective mass. So if you believe in this dispersion relation, then you can choose your epsilons and t's such that that quantity is EC and that quantity is h bar squared over 2m. That's what we normally do. Now the question is, what does, how do I modify this thing to include a magnetic field? Now with magnetic fields, the thing is that usually we think of magnetic fields in terms of the Lorentz force. That is, just as electric fields give rise to a force of Q times E, magnetic fields give you a force of Q times V cross B. By the way, uh, this Q is like the charge of the particle we are talking about. So if it is electrons, you should use minus Q. But usually the point is that you think in terms of electric fields and magnetic fields. Whereas when you are talking of in quantum mechanics, it is more convenient, I mean the way it works, is you use the potentials and the electric field for steady state fields, you know, non-time varying fields is given by negative of the gradient of the scalar potential while B is given by the curl of A. And it is these potentials, the scalar potential and the vector potential that actually enter into the Schrodinger equation. See? And the way the scalar potential enters is that it simply adds plus q phi to the thing, to this whole thing. So let me write it with a red pen so you see the change. 
So if you had a scalar potential, you'd just add that here. So that's straightforward. That we have kind of almost done often in this context. Actually, here again, I should note that it is Q phi if Q is the charge on the particle. If it was, if you're talking of electrons, I should write minus Q phi. That's what you would normally do. Okay, so that's fine. The question is, how does the vector potential enter this? And that is where the basic prescription is that the vector potential enters by instead of k, it becomes kx minus qax over h bar. Once again, q is the charge on the thing. So since you're talking of electrons, I should use minus q, so I should do this. So the basic rule is then instead of kx, it would become kx plus qax over h bar. And this though is not meant to be self-evident or anything. This is based on this Hamilton's equations of motion, which I'm not going into. This is in, uh, I guess the basic equations are there in the appendix of the notes that you can look at. But main thing I want to explain is given this, how do I modify my Hamiltonian that I'm using. How do I modify these epsilons and t's so that I get the right results? Now point is that if you believe that, then what you have to do then is just run this whole thing in reverse. That's all. You see, think of what we did here. We had epsilon plus t to the power i k x a plus t to the power minus i k x a. Where did we get that? Well, epsilon was the diagonal, t was the thing connection to the right, another t connection to the left. So from there, we took, we use this, uh, we turn this into cosine, and then we use this approximation to turn it into a quadratic. So now let's say we want to go backwards. So let me use a different pen. So instead of kx, I should now have kx plus qax over h bar. That's what you want to do. So, here, same story. Kx, I should use Kx plus Qax over h bar. So I had Kx squared a squared, instead I have this. So what has happened then is, instead of Kx, I'm picking this up. Okay, so same story here. Instead of cosine Kx a, I'll have Kx plus Qax over h bar, need to get a better pen. Times a. So I'm just working backwards everywhere, replacing the Kx with that. Well, now you can come here, same story. Instead of kx, you now have the extra q a x a over h bar. So here you'll pick up a e to the power minus i q a x a over h bar. And the same here. We'll pick up a e to the power plus i q a x a over h bar. So that's the basic story, you see. So what does that mean in terms of these parameters here? Well, the epsilon is unaffected. The t now picks up an extra phase factor. This was the coupling to the right. And so instead of being just a number t, it is now t times that extra phase factor. So it is t, let me write this with a red thing here. So it is t e to the power i q a x a over h bar. And here it will be t e to the power minus i q a x a over h bar. So that's the basic result. You see the result of the, what the vector potential does is adds this phase factor here and adds the phase factor there. That's it. And if we had talked about the ky part, you'd have got exactly a similar result. You see, what would have happened is that this connection would have picked up something that would have q a y instead of instead of the x component of the vector potential, you'd have the y component of the vector potential. And same here, you'd have the y component of the vector potential. Now, 
So how do you actually rep represent a magnetic field? Well, usually in these problems, you have a two-dimensional conductor in the xy plane, and the, and the magnetic field is in the z direction, it's perpendicular. So if you have bz, that's equal to the z component of the curl of A, which you can write as dAy dx minus dAx dy. And so given a magnetic field, there's a choice of different types of vector potentials one could use. So you can see easily, for example, you could have written Ay equals Bz times x. That would do it. Or you could write Ax equals minus Bz times y. That, that would do it as well. So in this case, you would have something that was varying along x, which means in a conductor like this, as you're going down, it would keep varying in this direction if you used Ay. If you use Ax, it would vary along the y direction. And usually it is more convenient to use the second one, this one. Something that varies along y. Because that way what happens is, it is varying along y, so you have something on this side, something here, something here, but then it's not varying along x. And so when you get to the contact where you have to treat an entire infinite contact along x, it's not varying inside that contact. And that's usually more convenient. So you could use that. And, and then that's it. So you can put in a magnetic field. As you change the magnetic field, all that happens is the phase factor changes. So really in terms of setting up the problem, once you have the basic code in place, it's really a relatively minor modification. And you can put in the magnetic fields and then you're ready to calculate. But of course, as I said, calculation you should treat is only the first step. What is really nice about this set of equations, this way of doing things that has developed over the last 20 years, is how straightforward the calculation is. But the point I always make is calculation should really be the first step. And then once you have this, you are ready to look at the Hall resistance and things like that and see if, if you can understand the physics underlying it. And that's what we'll do in the next module.